Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Oli Dibowada. I'm the Director for Human Capital, Youth and Skills Development at the African Development Bank. Um, and I'll be chairing this, moderating this session this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted to be moderating this session um, on education in Africa in 2030. But before I introduce... Okay. Before I introduce my panel, I just want to just set the stage um, on why we're having this discussion. And um, you know, as you're aware, we the discussion will you know will look at um, particularly on two of the discussions will look particularly on education in Africa, and then we will have um, one of them that would really look at the last mile on universal access to education. Um, we're all aware that um, Africa's youth is growing particularly and uh, would actually double to 830 million by the year 2050. And this is our greatest asset. Uh, the lack of access to you know, employment is a key fundamental issue, particularly as we're discussing the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, there is a huge demand for digitalization across health and education and other sectors. And um, this has created a, a large divide, the digital divide in Africa. So some of the key fundamental questions we will be asking is that, you know, how do we achieve the sustainable development goals? How do we prepare our youth, uh, our children for tomorrow's jobs? Uh, how can national education systems across Africa be strengthened so that we can ensure that uh, we equip our youth um, with uh, education that resonates with the uh, the continent's needs, and globally as well. Uh, and these are some of the issues that we are discussing in, in my organization, which is the African Development Bank, particularly on STEM, on science, technology, and innovation, um, creating jobs for youth, amongst, amongst others. So without much ado, I'm not, um, I have the easy job and the easy task here, so I'll just introduce um, uh, the, our esteemed speakers. Um, we have on my far right, uh, we have Miss Caitlin Barron, who is the CEO for Luminous Fund. Um, after Kate, we have uh, Vivian Onano, who is a youth ambassador for Water Aid and also a youth advisor um, on uh, education, particularly to the UN United Nations and uh, unemployment as well. And then um, next to me, we have Miriam Mason Cisse, who is the country um, a director for education, for edu Educate in Sierra Leone. So um, starting off with, uh, with Caitlin. So Caitlin, so you, you're speaking on the last mile access on education. What is your perspective? Um, tell us. Thank you so much, Uli, for the introduction. Um, and I may, Standing up, if I can, uh, only because uh, I'm not tall enough to see over the table. So, <laughs> um, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and thanks to everyone to a, a wonderfully robust after lunch crowd, which is surprising and, and uh, I think reflective of how important and close to all of our hearts this topic is. Thinking about Achieving our goals for African education in 2030 requires all of our very best ideas executed at enormous scale. And yet, far too often as a global education community, we divide ourselves into two separate conversations. On the one hand, the conversation of education innovation, focused on the extraordinary potential of adaptive learning, individualized instruction, this is the conversation of the Silicon Valleys, the Silicon Savannas of the world. And on the other hand, the conversation of universalization, the moral imperative to find a practical way to bring quality education to the 250 million children in the world who still fail to learn to read and write. And as we look at that daunting challenge, I mean, in the face of such a massive undertaking, Far too often, we revert to really narrow conceptions of what education can be. In the face of this extraordinary challenge, we fall back on limited metrics of counting bums in seats, and we revert to really narrow pedagogic tools, thinking about scripted instruction, teaching through worksheets. And in, in essence, we collectively settle for a form of education 
that we would never accept for our own children. When I think about my daughter Calliope, that kind of limited instruction would never be good enough for her. And on some basic fundamental sense, why have we decided that it's good enough for children like Tubebu, one of the children I came to know through our work in rural Ethiopia? Fundamentally, these two conversations, on the one hand, the education innovation conversation, and on the other hand, the education for the masses, these two conversations need to become one if we're to truly bring education to every single child in Africa. So let's take a step back and, and look at our sort of global collective report card. How are we doing on this issue of universal education? Well, in many ways, it's an encouraging story. Actually, in the last 15 years, the number of children around the world denied the chance to go to school has been reduced by 40%. That's actually an incredible number, and quite honestly, Education is a space where numbers like this move slowly. So <laughs> if we see that kind of change in that short period of time, it should actually embolden all of us to think about what's possible. The challenge for Africa, however, is that this picture looks quite different. Uh, and Africa is, in fact, the only region in the world where essentially the same number of children are out of school today as were out of school 15 years ago. Now, to be clear, Part of the reason that's true is because of some fantastic dividends on the health side of the equation. So many, many more children are surviving to an older age, and African education systems have often struggled to, to grow fast enough to accommodate all of the children um, their countries now hold. The good news is that this uniquely African problem has a uniquely African solution. And there are multiple African countries that have invested in concerted and deep ways and driven real innovation in finding new ways to reach that last one in 10 children in the world denied the chance to go to school. Ethiopia is one example I know firsthand, but there are multiple. Ethiopian government, as recently as 2000, 60% of Ethiopian children were denied the chance to go to school with concerted investment at the highest levels on the continent, and a focus on real innovation using mobile schools, uh, investing in latrines to create access for both boys and girls. Ethiopia has actually dropped that number in to at an incredible rate, such that 86% of young Ethiopian children are now enrolled in school. My organization, Luminos, is proud to be one of the innovations in that portfolio of initiatives the Ethiopian government has undertaken. We've worked in partnership with the National Ministry over the last eight years to run an innovative program of helping children who are 10 or 11 years old and have never been to school catch back up to grade level in just one year and mainstream in their local government school. Over the last eight years, we've helped over 100,000 Ethiopian children get a second chance at education through this program. And I'm proud to say that as of last year, uh, we're in direct partnership with the ministry now, upskilling uh, government school teachers to deliver this program directly themselves. This kind of innovation is exactly what will be required for solving these last mile issues of universal access. And what's hard for us as a global education sector is that in general, we're pretty comfortable with top-down policy. Um, if you think about we're pretty good at coming together as a global community and setting global goals, be they the MDGs or the SDGs. Those, are, those global goals are fairly reasonably translated into national policy statements. But that's where things get messy. And as all of us who work in this space know, when you get down to school level, so much of the implementation falls short of those national policy goals. And there's little to no accountability back to national level to pull those insights back up. What's needed to leach, reach the last one in 10 children in the world still out of school is to flip this paradigm on its head. Um, we have to make space for national governments to conduct small experimentation. Uh, and NGOs can be a really important partner in that process. We have to help governments test new models at scale. And then ultimately, let success on the ground inform national policy. And it's only through this real bottom-up innovation process that we'll actually land on the models that will solve this challenge for the last 10% of kids.
So why is this all so important? I mean, it all comes back to Tibebu and so many millions of children just like him. Tibebu came to our program four years ago. His mother had died a number of years before that, and he passed from home to home in his extended family without a real settled plan and with no plan to get him enrolled in school. At the time he came to us, he was living with his grandmother. She heard about our program and she came running. She said to us, not one of my children went to school, but I won't let that happen to this boy. Tibebu enrolled in our program, did exceptionally well through his hard work and effort, and today he's a fifth grade student in his local village school. And what he achieved is possible for every child in rural Ethiopia and across the rest of the continent. And it's imperative upon all of us to make that opportunity possible. Children like Tibebu can't wait until 2030 for us to solve these last mile education issues. They need solutions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Caitlin. Um, just as you've highlighted, I think it's important that we uh, ensure that the, the, the education discourse targets or focuses on um, those that are, um, you know, those that are really at the bottom of the, of the pit. Um, access to education um, has increased, but, you know, the quality aspect of it is, is, um, is still lacking. Um, I think these are some of the things that we really need to look at. Um, what are we educating for and who are we educating for? Um, to what extent does uh, our education system resonate with education for jobs, for employability? Um, so I think there's a huge disconnect between what we are educating and uh, preparing our, our children for the world of work to be employed or to, to be self-employed themselves. So um, I'll now invite Miriam to really um, speak to the area of um, you know, education and what must we be doing? Are we on the right track? And uh, what must we prioritize? So Miriam, what's the big idea? Thank you. Um, I'm another short one, so, uh, so I can see what I'm talking about, so I'm here too. Um, African education, Africa, we are so often looking at, you know, a presentation of Africa, helpless, hopeless, and asking for, for help because we're at the bottom of the pile and so on. And I feel very strongly that we need to sort of really delete this often charity-led, NGO-led presentation of Africa and say, uh-uh, you know, the first civilizations were in Africa and we're all descended from this um, one mitochondrial Eve. We, we, we need to reclaim our, our primacy or, or, or our, our position as leaders within the, within the world rather than all the time being on the receiving end of the agenda, of the decisions made by others, and so on. We believe, and we hear it all the time, don't we, that education is the most powerful weapon. Um, and yeah, we hear it from, from all of our key people, but how many really, really are saying education of everybody? But I think Mohamed Sidibe said it um, yesterday, those of you who were in the plenary session in the morning, we neglect education at our peril. Is that me doing that? <laughs> uh, um, you know, it's a very, very powerful tool. Or the lack of it is powerfully, powerfully setting people apart. And we can harness that power or we can neglect it. We can make sure that everybody is accessing the, the means to fulfill their potential or is left on the sidelines and then resents it. Sierra Leone, where I work, um, you know, there was a good group of marginalized youth ready to be harvested for the war because they've been, you know, they've not had any way of controlling anything for how long? And then all of a sudden, you know, they offered a gun to right, you know? And, you know, we're still at the moment, if you look at the current situation, 
there are 48 of Africa's countries that have HDIs, uh, HDI values. You know, it's criminal, isn't it, that 31 of those right at the bottom are in the low um, human development band on the HDI. You know what I mean by the HDI, the human development index going from most developed through down to an awful lot of sub-Saharan Africa. And the bottom 19 countries are in Africa. There are no good reasons for that. There are only bad reasons for that. There is extraordinary wealth. And it's, I think, the face of the poverty is all the different things we talk about, the lack of health care, the lack of justice, etc. But the answer is going to be education. You know, we see infographic after infographic telling us about all the difficult statistics about education in Africa. And, you know, yes, there are some non-African ones there, and then you check, they're way up the HDI from what we're talking about. Now, there again. Now, these are two people that I sort of combined their thinking in my head last year. Tom Friedman spoke to this um, uh, meeting last year, and he talked about the 2006 exponential rate of change, that that was the sort of kick point for everything changing. And I combined that with Paul Collier's stuff about the bottom billion. You know, his, his thing is there are seven billion of us on the planet, six billion are basically, things are getting better, and then there's the bottom billion. And tragically, there's an awful lot of sub-Saharan Africa stuck in that bottom billion. And if you combine the two thing, the things, you think, flipping neck, it's even worse than I realized in terms of how fast we are being left behind in so many ways. So are we going to carry on with that and just, you know, that 2006 rate of acceleration away from us of the rest of the world and we still stay down here? Or, so there are some choices. We need to think about what the purpose of education is, and yes, okay, the economic one is, is crucial, but I think when we la allow that to drive things, then we miss out on so much, and actually it doesn't end up working. Because as we, as we focus on economic benefit and financial benefit and profit, then it doesn't work to then be thinking about us so well it's much more challenging to have an us we model if we're thinking about the economics than if we're you know very money focused and it turns ends up being focused on an individual those of you that have anything to do with southern africa which i'm not pretending to i'm i'm in west africa but we we in our schools borrow this idea from southern africa of ubuntu I don't know how many of you are fed up with this TIA, this is Africa, what do you expect? Of course it's broken, of course it's corrupt, of course they're late, of course they're not professional. You know, enough of that. Ubuntu is about real humanity, real African humanity, and it means we don't even matter as individuals, it means we matter when we are we, when we are community, when we are functioning together. Now if we can actually get back to those African values, you know, to the days where if you, if you nicked a goat from somebody, you'd be ostracized, you know, you wouldn't, nobody would be going, oh, well, this is Africa. You'd be out you know, until you fixed it, you put that relationship right. If you deceived your neighbor, that would be considered to be really destructive of the community. So my thinking really is that we need, yeah, EdTech is great, and it can do some fantastic things, but it needs to not be about solving an individual problem. It needs to be about helping us solve we problems, helping us actually come together and fight things together. You know, these, th these are the EdTechs that we see, and it's great. This is my EdTech. You know, this is, you know we've, we've got how many hundred kids in a classroom, and yet they are all learning, and they're learning ind independently, but you know, these are the kids across Africa, and all gathered under a light to study at night. But we need to have, if we're gonna change this bottom billion thing, we've got to have massive, massive mobilization. And it won't do, you know, for it only to be an African problem. We need to have the whole world saying, right, when we talked about the destabilizing of the world if we carry on having this imbalance, and if the imbalance is growing and growing, 
we are going to have, you know, the refugee crisis will be nothing in comparison to what will come if we don't sort out this, you know, this real significant problem. You know, a seventh of the world's population left behind in those ways. So we need to have a human focus to our education and we need to leapfrog some of these things. You know, yeah, okay, Shakespeare's great, but what is this devotion in, you know, to the grammar school style education that happens to prove that what you're trying to say, we're less than you and we can't do your grammar school style, forget it. You know, let's do an African resonating education and that is driven by African values and African ideas and sit that suits an African model. How? Let's do that leapfrogging. Let's have renewable energies that are, um, you know, not we're going to have to go via the national grid. You know, that's never going to happen in places like Sierra Leone. We're never going to have a national grid that reaches every last thing. But we can with renewable energies. We need locally relevant, locally, you know, designed, locally appropriate curricula. And let's move away from those um, assessments that are keeping us tied to a global thing about maths and English and me and not actually counting the things that matter. And if it's not counted, if it's not measured, then it's devalued. So I was, I was thinking about all of this and I looked through this. Uh, you see, I don't have the patience to watch it. There is a, if I wait for it. There's a timeline. Anyway, I won't bother. Um, there's a timeline on there of all of how education has changed and changed and changed and changed. And it's talking about the future. And it's talking about how the teacher has be can become in the future, not the controller of um, all the content, but the facilitator. And I thought, actually, you know what? We are doing that. Yes, we're not doing it on tablets and we're not doing it on the, the internet and all the rest of it. But in our schools, in Sierra Leone, in the eighth, ninth poorest country in the world, we, that's what we've got. We've got teachers as facilitators and they are allowing through pre-prepared materials and pre-prepared activities a different way. It's quite possible for Africa to lead the way. We don't have to be on the receiving end all the time. So choices to make, to believe in ourselves, to have a, a global movement where we, we really say, you ignore us at our peril because we will end up with youngsters so ready to destabilize because they will fight for their own unless we are teaching them different values and different ways and teaching them and you know prioritizing them. Or we carry on with the me and mine model. And tragically, so far, I think a lot has been, um, it's been true far too often that we've been satisfied with people, uh, some oppressed, jumping camp and joining the oppressors. And that's looked like success. If we don't change the basic status quo, and as people leave the camp of being the oppressed and the uneducated and the ones with no voice, to actually challenging that model and saying, no, let's change the status quo. Oppression dehumanizes all of us. You know, we can to expect to just change the names of the the oppressors, change the names of the ones that have, but not changing anything very real. Those are my, my two, two big things. Let's leapfrog the unnecessary ways and let's do it with a real focus on how to be more human rather than how to be more um, me personally successful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Uh, just as you rightly said, um, Ubuntu, I am because we are. Um, I think um, too often, um, because we have been focusing on an, uh, a system that really doesn't resonate um, uh, with education for Africa, by Africans, that resonates within our African culture and values, um, our youth and our children have become targets of uh, fundamentalist groups trying to migrate to seek greener pastures in, in Europe. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, um, these are some of the challenges we, we, we experience. So I think maybe we need to go back to the drawing board and, and, and revisit what exactly are we trying to, to educate for whom and, and by whom and, and, and you know, what for. Um, you, know, you also touched on the area of uh, having uh, looking towards a, a learner-centered 
approach as opposed to a teacher-centered approach, which you're already doing in Sierra Leone, which is really good. So I think, um, um, as you had mentioned, um, you talked about here about the, us being descendants of the uh, matricamial, Mitochondrial Eve, uh, Eve. <laughs> and um, we have a panel of all Eves here, so <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, I'll now invite uh, Vivian um, to speak, and Vivian will be talking about um, education and skills development, particularly looking at girls' education and STEM. Okay, Vivian. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are talking about young people. We should feel the energy in the room. Good afternoon once again. Perfect. We are heading somewhere. Um, it's an honor to be here today and to be a part of this panel uh, with these esteemed ladies that I have great admiration and respect for um, as a young person. So um, the AU declared 2009 to 2018 as the decade for youth development, um, investing in young people around health, education, access to technology, opportunities, access to capital, and strategies to combat youth unemployment and underemployment. By 2050, 29% of the total youth population will live in Africa. And we continue to say that young people are an asset, and most of the continent, because I come from one of the most youthful continents um, in the history of civilization. And uh, we continue to say young people are, are an asset. Yet last year, around November, we all saw the documentary by CNN, young people from the continent being sold in Europe as slaves for less than $400. So clearly, we've not achieved, um, we've, not, um, we've not achieved what we promised young people based on the AU declaration of uh, youth, decade for youth development. And education is the basic foundation for human development. With an education, you're empowered, you have a voice, you have access to opportunities, and you can create those opportunities for yourself. Um, I've, I've been very fortunate to travel across the continent um, advocating for education, meeting with government leaders, private sector leaders, and everywhere I go, and the young people that I meet, the first question they ask me, can you help us get jobs? And they're not talking about the white collar jobs. They just need jobs to be able to put food on the table, to be able to have shelter on top of their heads and to be able to clothe the basic needs. Um, and when it comes to girls' education, I think girls are hard hit when it comes to access to education because of our culture, because of uh, our traditions that have been there. Um, I came, I was born and raised um, in a village in Western Kenya. And at the time, girls' education was not prioritized. Girls were married off for as cheap as one kettle or two kettle. I mean, I have a 12-year-old cousin who had a baby at the age of 12. She doesn't even know how to wash the baby, clean the baby, and now she's married. So these are realities that I live with, not things I just read or I see on TV. Um, back to your question on skill, addressing the skills gap. Um, I think the biggest issue right now is addressing the skills gap. Um, the education that we are getting is not what the job market requires. And now we're talking about AI, uh, fourth industrial revolution. How are we equipping our teachers? How are we investing in our teachers to be the facilitators um, that Mariam was talking about? Um, so that they can, in turn, equip the young people with the knowledge and the skills for them to be competitive, not only at the national level, but at the global level. I would like to give a good example of uh, African Leadership Academy, one of the great institutions that I've been fortunate to be a part of and also just watch their growth. Um, a month ago, they celebrated their decennial, um, which, is, which is amazing. They had very many people from across the continent. 
Africa Leadership Academy is focused on creating the next generation of young leaders using entrepreneurship and, and technology. Um, when you talk about education, when you talk about addressing the skills gap, the political will is very important. We cannot do all this if we don't have the right policies in place, if we don't have the investments allocated towards education. So political goodwill is going to go a long way. So in a nutshell, Africa Leadership Academy, over the past 10 years, has been able to empower 983 young leaders from 46 countries across the continent. And these young leaders have, in turn, created 177 ventures across the continent that has created jobs for young people. So I think moving forward, there's going to be importance in investing in science, technology, arts, maths, entrepreneurship, and design education. Um, if you're going to, if you're addressing the uh, skills gap, but also talking about 2030 because of the technological revolution that's going on. And when we talk about entrepreneurship, I think we also have to equip the young people with the necessary skills. Financial literacy is very important. Creative thinking is very important. Innovation is very important. And then we come to access to, access to capital. But that capital, how well are they educated to be able to manage that capital? So I think we, it's going to go back to equipping our teachers. Um, yes, they're facilitators, but how well are they equipping the 21st kind of technology um, with the right um, entrepreneurship skills and design thinking skills to be able to impart that knowledge to the students? And also, when you look at the rural areas, um, most kids are left behind. And uh, we talk about the whole mobile technology revolution. But when you go back to where I come from, they don't have the smartphones. They still have like the local remote phone that you only text and call. And yet, talking about technology and all these apps that they can use uh, to revolutionize the space and where they're coming from. But then most of them don't have that. It's not a reality. They don't even have sometimes access. The, the, the network connection is not even there to begin with. So how are we making sure that nobody is left behind? So I think these are some of the things that we need to address. Um, and then it's also important for us to have an Africa education fund. Uh, most of the time, we tend to rely on running to the West people to invest in our education. But what if the policies change? Does it mean that we no longer have the, the investment in education that we need? So it's also important for us to have an Africa education fund. And that's going to be more focused on our governments and the political will to increase the tax base for us to have the local um, local, uh, what is it called, local funding for the education. And also it's important for us to monitor, evaluate, and hold people accountable. You can have all the resources, but if people are not held accountable, then at the end of the day, we are not reaching the people that we need to reach out to. And then that's how people are left behind, and that's how we are not addressing the mismatch in the skills development. So in a nutshell, I think those are some of the things that we need to address. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vivian. You heard it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, the youth are telling us what they want and how they want it. Um, jobs for youth, uh, so this is a basic necessity now. We, we see what is happening in our, in our countries. Um, I think uh, we need to focus on skills for employability. Um, there's a lot of talk and a lot of buzz on artificial in intelligence, on um, fourth industrial revolution. Um, there is a ship that is sailing. Um, whether the continent is on that ship um, is something we need to question. Whether we like it or not, whether we believe in it or not, that ship is sailing. And come 2030, everything would be digitalized. So are we preparing our youth? Are we preparing our countries? Are we preparing our economies um, for those? There are so many um, opportunities that are being created across the continent, um, looking at um, setting up leadership skills. Um, that you've talked about the Africa Leadership for uh, Academy. Um, institutions like uh, the African Development Bank is, uh, is trying to do the same, trying to create a, a Jobs for Youth initiative that looks at creating 25 million jobs, a very ambitious vision, um, targeting 50 million people by 2025. Um, so really working on looking at TVET, um, science, technology, innovation, and STEM. Um, but um, I think we need to use the Ubuntu approach. We need to come together and make sure that happens. 
Um, you touched again, Vivian, on the African Education Fund. This is something that we at uh, the African Development Bank are also discussing with governments and also with um, Pan-African institutions um, to look at how we can set up a fund that would be managed by Africans, for Africans, that resonates with Africa, but um, focusing on the science and technology area so that we are able to um, jump on that ship and, and, and move forward with it. Um, on monitoring and evaluation, I think we all need to hold ourselves accountable. But I think um, most of us um, in this room, as I keep saying, are BBCs. We were born before computers. We have the youth here. So I think um, they need to be the watchdogs to start monitoring and evaluation, evaluating us and taking us accountable. So in a nutshell, we've had uh, um, some rich um, um, interventions from the panelists. I'll um, take the floor now to see if you've got any questions or comments or feedback. Very brief so that um, we can have a, a, a rich discussion. I'll take the first round. Um, the gentleman here, uh, I see more men. Why are, where are the women? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. One, uh, two men. I'll take one, two women and then we'll do another round. Um, microphone, please. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Silas Rokwamba. I'm from uh, Rwanda. Uh, I've been in education for many years. Um, I, I, I liked what Vivian said, and I think she gave quite a number of examples, including the African uh, Leadership Academy which has produced in 10 years of uh, nearly 1,000 graduates with entrepreneurship, and they start their own business. But you look at uh, Africa, 1,000 a, a is a, a very small drop in the ocean. Countries uh, like Rwanda, we have done uh, giving computers to kids, decoding, and so on and so forth. We brought in a company to produce uh, computers, so that the cheap computers to give to the kids. We set up, you know, all sorts of uh, ICT and education programs. But you are still struggling in terms of linking. Even Tibet is growing very fast. Linking education and the labor market. It's still a big problem. And I think uh, Vivian tried to touch it. As long as we don't bring it into Tibet schools, we don't bring it to higher education institutions, it's going to be a struggle. We still have professors who think they are gods in themselves. They teach what they want. They, some of them have not even practiced in the, in, the, in the industry. So what are we going to do? It's a big, big headache. Either we totally change the curriculum, I mean, we try to do it in Rwanda with competence based curriculum, mm -hmm. but at up to secondary schools, we are not going to universities. It's a problem. So, my question is what can we do? Who has, what's the best practice in Africa here where we can learn from each other? It's a big problem. So maybe you can discuss more. I've got some of my own ideas for filling up gaps and so on and so forth, but some other people might have some other ideas. Otherwise, if you don't bring up skills, fill up the, the, this gap between universities and labor market, we're going to talk nothing of 2030. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency Professor Silas. Uh, the, another professor as well. Uh, panelist, I hope you're taking note what else can we do? What can we learn and who can we learn from in the continent? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Professor Anku from Ghana. And the uh, problems of Africa, as far as education is concerned, are plenty. And uh, I would suggest we have a platform <coughs> for Africa for us to discuss the issues and find solutions to them. 
if we can appeal to VACI to, to support us, I've been talking to them. But they say we should get together and then appeal to them and see how much they can help for us to have a platform so that African teachers can get together, discuss the problems from a practical way, how we can solve this myriad of problems. I have a, one or two questions to ask. One is, what do we mean by quality education? What are we envisaging for Africa as what constitutes you know, quality education? Is it the examination results we get that we consider as quality? If you are getting 100%, 90%, then you are doing very well. Is that what we want? Or what, what use you can put your education in terms of national development, skills? Is that, what, what do we want? Are we very sure? Do we know what we want? Now, let me give you a scenario which needs the change of curriculum. Our own way. We are talking on leak, you know, frogging, you know, the situation as it is. Do we follow the grammar schools or we develop our own? Can't we develop our own? Let me give you an example. You know, there used to be this issue of children running away from homes. Instead of going to school, they go to fish. They go to weave things like this. Can take them away. And they're not part of the curriculum. But this, they can get skills from these places. I've suggested several times, you see on TV, NGOs come, they come and arrest the students from wherever they are working, take them back home. After one month, they get back to the place. So what use is all of that? So I've been suggesting, why if the person needs fishing, why don't you set up a fishing school in the community? So they go and do whatever theory in the morning, after they go to practical to learn how to fish. So that they bring all of those things together and they can also put bread on the table. Instead of just going for this theory, theory, theory is not helping in a way. Thank just you. go and get a certificate, say I've gone, you know, secondary school, I've also graduated. They cannot do you anything. Yeah. But we are following the same pattern. Nothing is going to happen. Thank you. you so we need to and I want to ask something. You see, no, no, sorry, sorry, wouldn't sorry, get sorry. others wouldn't get the chance to. I talk know, I know, I know. Let me just add this. It's a good idea for listen. Is that something I do in Ghana? That's what brought me here, and I want to share that to all African countries when we have the platform. You see, because I do. I'm in the area of mathematics, and what I've realized is that we don't relate the concept of mathematics to real life. It's all theory. It doesn't work. But when I introduce practical mathematics, there's a whole lot of difference. And I'm prepared to share that with everybody. You know, Africa. Okay. Just invite me, I'll come and share with you. That's all. It, it's, a, it's a date. It's a date, Professor. Yeah, thank we'll you. take you on your word. Okay. Um, yeah, let me just save that so that we can have the floor. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the floor. Um, I had the, the lady in front here and the one behind. Um, please make it short, sweet, yeah. and snappy I, so that I we can invite others, thanks. provide the opportunity. Um, so my name is Diane Robinson. I went to Teach for All, and uh, we have partners, uh, Teach for Nigeria, Teach for Uganda, and Teach for Ghana, who have been operating um, for a couple years now. Um, and one of the things we're seeing, and I actually I wanted to double down on what you said, Vivian, I think is your name. African Leadership Academy was so inspiring. I spent a couple days there watching the instruction, and I think you spoke to this also about holistic instruction. And it's not what you see in the schools. You still see a very teacher-centered way of instructing students. So I guess my question is more around what is it going to take to shift the workforce, right, in terms of the training and the development that it's going to take to basically teach in a very different way. The instruction that happens at ALA is not what you see in everyday government schools, that's right? True. So that's my question is how do you shift and sort of reimagine what instruction can look like and, and how do we support the educators in, in that training and development? Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. My name is Josephine um, Saidu. I'm working to join in Teach for All, so it's going to be Teach for Sierra Leone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my background, I'm a journalist, and based um, from what you said, that we need to do the assessment evaluation, and that's what I've been doing in the educational sector, and that got me to what I'm doing today. Um, for me, I think I just said it in, um, in another meeting wherein we need to depoliticize education. Let the actors, the, the union, let them do their job. Stay away from politics. The government has to move away from using education as a gimmick. Because this is the future of kids in the rural communities where I think they suffer adverse inequality. So for me, I think even the structures that are in place, the commission, they have to give them the free will to operate. Because there are a lot of things out there in Sierra Leone that needs urgent attention. And for me, I've declared Sierra Leone's education system as an emergency. And for the bank, African Development Bank, I made to understand that there was a point in time where they had to suspend funding for education in Sierra Leone because the benchmarks were not met. I want to know how do you intend to scale up your operations with other organizations like not-for-profit organizations that can literally deliver you know, give you those results that we need to move education forward in Sierra Leone. And I think testing models is workable. That's why I'm joining Teach for, um, Teach for All organization because it has worked in Ghana and we share similar context. In Nigeria as well, they started with 40 and now they're moving on to 250 fellows. So I think the bank has to take on board some of these. The African Leadership Develop um, Academy. Academy in South Africa. I met the guy, and I think they're doing an incredible job. These are stuff that we need to take and replicate in other countries and try to move things forward. The teacher aspect, we need to develop the teachers. We need okay. to move away from the conventional teaching and bring participatory and active teaching in the classroom. But for me to sum up is that we need to set up appraising structures because these teachers, they're not used to appraisals. Mm -hmm. How do you make the teaching environment or the teaching profession enviable is something we have to think about and make the better place for our kids in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take another for another set of round of, um, of comments before we invite the panel because uh, in the interest of time. I'll take two from this side and two from this side. I'll take the, the lady, one, and a gentleman here, two, uh, a gentleman there and a lady there. I'm trying to be to balance the gender. If we have time, we'll do another round. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry. This. Uh, yeah. Yes. Hi. This is Ulrike from Germany. Um, we are mentoring uh, entrepreneurs in Africa, um, specifically in uh, northern Nigeria. So I, whenever I. Uh, First of all, I wanted to thank M Miriam. She really hit the point that I always want to make. Um, and also the professor with the nice jacket from uh, Ghana. <laughs> uh, I think it is, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I think um, when we talk about uh, education in, uh, in uh, Africa, it's always a little bit like having a fish climbing up the tree because um, we are putting, uh, we are setting curriculum that are actually meant for the West um, and we're forcing the people actually to always be a step behind. So I wondered, you the panelists, if you could mention a few things that you would rather see being incorporated in the curricula for Africa to help Africa and to prepare Africans for the future of Africa and not the future of um, going out and using the skills somewhere else. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Nick Kafka from Teacher Mount to Fish. Um, I think we have interesting uh, proven solutions for uh, skills in secondary schools and primary schools, so I'd be happy to speak to the people on this side of the room later. But it, it seems to me that there's a... Uh, it's, you know, we, we, get, we hear a lot about the primary side of things and the need to get kids into primary schools and the importance of you know, basic numeracy and literacy. And then there's all the people who get excited by brilliant work done by the African Leadership Academy uh, and some of that work that's going on at the other end of the spectrum at tertiary. 
But for a country where we operate like uh, Uganda, actually, you know, only 23% of kids are going to secondary school. There's a big hole in the middle. So what do the panelists think is the solution to filling this hole in the middle? Because if we don't have this opportunity to get kids into school, and that's when you need to be teaching them some of the skills that might make them successful later, we have primary graduates and a very small elite of uh, university graduates. Thank you. Um, yes, the gentleman there and the other lady. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I am a practicing primary school teacher from Africa, and, 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 and specifically Malawi. Um, I think I wouldn't bother you to, to, to give a litany of African uh, educational problems. You know them too well, right? You know them too well. But if we are here to judge the ability of a fish, of how a fish swim, then we are judging it, how it can climb a tree, then we are making a very big mistake. Right? We, in our own context, as Ghana, as Malawi, as Kenya, we have our own problems in, within our context. Now, change lies with individuals. Professor here has said there is something that has brought him here. What is it? He has to be utilized by the Ghanaian Education uh, Department. Mm -hmm. I am from Malawi, Southern Africa. There is something that I'm doing locally that probably we should have time for others to learn. That is what is making a change mm -hmm. in that particular locality. Another thing is we can change um, our curriculum many, many, many times. Mm -hmm. But if teachers are not oriented on what to do, forget it. You can bring in technologies, talk to them about Google, about whatever. But if teachers are not oriented, there is a zero that is going to be achieved. Most, most of the times, you have a curriculum that is very well conceived. And then as it goes down to go and now orient the teachers on how they can deliver the curriculum, no funding. How do you expect teachers to be equipped with the necessary skills to implement a curriculum? Okay. And another thing, we are talking about resources. How do we mobilize resources? We are here. We are talking about what is going to happen uh, by 2030. How ready are we? How ready? You see? So the picture is very blurred. It's very missed. But there is hope. Hope lies with us individuals that we should go there and bring change and teach our children with the resources that are there so that we don't just catch up. We are with the rest of everybody that is here. Thank That's you. what I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um. Thank you very much. My name is Juliet Wajega. I work with Uganda National Teachers Union. I have two issues. I want to take one from where he stopped. For the teachers, it's not just orienting them. It's actually involving them. Whether it's an innovation, whether it's in policy, teachers must, must be part and parcel. And there are actually some small innovations which the teachers themselves can come up with and which can be shared. And then the second point is about the population explosion. We are talking of getting, I don't know, funding, and yet it has been projected that in the next 30 years or so, the population in Africa is going to double. So if it doubles, what shall we do? So uh, I'm asking that maybe we need, how do we come up with maybe a, a curriculum or something that will target pop, uh, use of maybe family planning or people getting to produce less in Africa such that by 2030 we don't have those very big numbers that we shall not even have classes to fit them. So then the teenage pregnancy also is very high. Currently in my country it stands at 25%. 
So how do we get a curriculum or how do we skill teachers such that they can support these girls not to end up getting pregnant at that early age? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've had uh, eight um, sets of questions and comments. I'll invite the panelists to respond to that. Uh, for the lady that asked the question with ADB, maybe we can discuss offline. I don't want to take the discussion um, to deviate it. Um, so, Caitlin, do you want to pick on some of the questions? Or should we pass it? Or Vivian, do you want to start? I, I'm happy to, but I think some of them are directed to Vivian, so perhaps she should start and then yes. I can add. Vivian, do you want to? <clears throat> okay, I have lots of questions. I, didn't know, I don't know exactly which one was directed to me. But first of all, I'm going to start with the professor. Um, you spoke about creating a platform for uh, African educators um, to share about their, their, their solutions, right? And I know for a fact the president of Ghana is creating that platform and is launching it um, on the 11th of May and is bringing African educators donors, philanthropists, governments, um, and, uh, and private sector, because I don't just think that educators should have a platform for their own conversations, because that's what has been happening, and that's where we are where we are right now. I think everybody should be hands on deck, both from the private sector, from the governments, from civil society, from the professors and educators, and even from young people, so that we can then chart the path forward towards um, 2030. So I know your government is working on that. So maybe it's something that we can explore. And your Minister of Education is also here, so we can talk to him. And then um, changing of curriculum to our own. I think changing, changing curriculum is one thing, but how well do we understand the curriculum? How well, it goes back to the question on uh, the teachers, how well are they equipped to be facilitators and uh, to participate, to be active participants? Um, rather than just be um, conventional teachers. So I think it's also a matter of understanding the curriculum and uh, what is the curriculum trying to address and the people who are supposed to facilitate that curriculum, how best do they understand it? And also I think it's going to get us to the point that, yes, you're talking about the fourth industrial revolution and, uh, and uh, digitalizing everything moving forward. But also where do we, where do we place our local languages? Because um, I think that's something that we haven't addressed, and that's how also many of the kids are left behind. So, and it's a, another whole conversation, but I think we also need to think about how do you place our local languages because they have a role to play in making sure that the education is inclusive and nobody's left behind, mostly when you're trying to look at the kids in the rural uh, areas. And then professors teaching what they want, I think they, it's important for us for institutions to invest in professional development of professors. And uh, <laughs> why are you laughing, my sister? Uh, I think it's very important um, because if we don't continue investing in the educators and the professors, as you say, that's why then they think that they can teach whatever they want because they're not knowledgeable on, on the technologies and all the inv innovations that are happening currently. And the students, in a, as a result, get frustrated because the students are more aware and uh, they're more aware and they know what's happening, but there's a disconnect between the students and the professor. So continuous professional development is important um, for the teachers. And uh, I can't say that it should be the government's role. I think it should be the institution's role to, to continue investing in their professors um, for them to be able to also address um, the issue on uh, education and labor markets. When you talk also about uh, the struggle between linking education and la labor markets, internships are going to be very important. Ongoing internship as you go into school. So how do you make sure that there's a partnership between the education sector and the private sector to create those opportunities for young people to get internship? Because the problem also is lack of internship has also led to the huge unemployment. Because you leave school and they ask you for three years uh, experience, five years experience, 10 years experience, but you just left school. So what are you supposed to do? That has also led to the whole frustration around youth unemployment. So I think we also need to have the partnership between the education sector 
and the private sector uh, to create internship opportunities for young people from as early age as graduating from high school so that they can be exposed to the job market, learn the communication skills, um, the presentation skills, the interpersonal skills, which are soft skills, but also very important going into the 2030. Thank you. Okay, um, Miriam. Oh, sorry, that was me thinking you were gonna go over to Caitlin. Um, listening to all of the comments, my, my, my strong feeling is, if we don't have a change of community perception on what education should be achieving, we are really banging our heads against a brick wall. We, you know, we can train our teachers to deliver a more creative, more critical thinking, growth mindset, all the rest of it, sort of curriculum with, you know, where we're always ready to learn the next new thing, all the rest of it. Our parents, don't want that for their children. They want the traditional, pass that, flip an exam. And then what you've got is a bunch of exam passers. They're no use to any employer. And they're, you know, they're no use to the development of the country. And it's a massive, massive issue. That traditional drive for passing those traditional assessments is absolutely killing. Mm -hmm. And this is why we need to dare to stand up and say, no, enough. As Africans, why are the heck are we still hungry for British GCSEs and, and you know all of this nonsense? And even in the WAS, the West African Senior Secondary Certificate Examination, um, you know they all have to do Shakespeare. It's like I say, yeah, I love Shakespeare, but you know it, that's not what's going to get you a job unless you know how to use that really well in a very exciting, creative way, which is not what's happening. You know, if they were sort of learning from the politics and looking and applying it to today's situation and seeing how humanity doesn't change, does it? So we better learn to manipulate it and all the rest of it. Great, but that isn't what's happening. And so there needs to be not just this deification of exam passing as a, as a which has become a proxy for education, but it's a, it's a wrong, misplaced proxy in my humble opinion. And so values first, skills next, subject content. I mean, don't get me wrong, we want knowledgeable, well-informed youngsters, not making it up, we don't need fake facts, but you know, that needs to be the ranking, I think. And if you, I say to my kids all the time, you know, I don't even want to help you one millimeter forwards if your heart's not in the right place because you will use those enhanced skills and qualifications and knowledge to do further damage to Sierra Leone. Um, you know, I need your heart in the right place then let's get you skilled up in critical thinking and all the rest. You will then go and find the knowledge that you need, the subject content that is necessary for the tasks that you, you know, are appearing. But my word have we got a task ahead of us in terms of community education about what the community needs. And we're not doing that thinking. We're not engaging with our countries to do that thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just get to Caitlin to, to <laughs> respond and we... We'll see if we can get one, one more round. Perfect. So I, I think there's been a particularly rich conversation across this entire conference about the challenge of educating for the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and I think we're all right to live up to Tagore's famous challenge not to limit our children's education to our own knowledge for they were born in a different time. But in the interest of keeping the conversation lively, I'll offer one note of caution, which is I think that as the education community, we should be careful about setting job creation as a metric for the education system. I think education is a necessary but not sufficient condition for economic development. And we should just be thoughtful about the role that education plays in the broader context of macroeconomic policy which is not to curtail our ambition at all, but just not to set ourselves up for epic disappointment. If you know, even the best education system in the world in the face of a slagging national economy can only go so far. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I'll take one here and uh, one there, and then we see how that goes. Can I just say one of the things about Africa um, Microphone, please. 
I won't yell now. And one of the things about Africa is Africa, Africa does have some excellent teachers. And there's one in the top 10 for tonight. So um, even if she doesn't get the top one, make sure you get behind her and use her as a voice for, for pushing what good teachers do. And I just look around the room because I know there's people who have been in the top 50 for the, the Global Teacher Prize um, all around the room. So um, Africa's got some really good teachers. Thank you. Um, and the lady over there, please. Thank you. I'm Bernadette from James Cambridge International Kampala in Uganda. I would like to suggest a solution, a little solution to our possibly big inability to get jobs. Um, two things. There is something that we call, like Vivian said, soft skills. If there would be a deliberate um, policy or a deliberate policy at schools levels or at um, ministry, government levels, where um, secondary schools or tertiary schools are also allowed to go into the job market, find out from the employers, find out from the job creators what they would be expecting of the person that they'll be employing. Not only the hard skills, the soft skills also, the resilience, um, cooperation, hard work. Apart from me being a teacher, I should be able to live with those other people whom I've not even grown up with. Then the second one is... Um, a BTEC kind of teaching. I am seated here with my colleague from Nairobi, both of us doing BTEC business. Uh, what better way to orient someone on what they are going to do, create the job, or get the job, than actually feeling um, or having a feel of what they will have? It would be good that we take our students um, to the nearest industry, to the nearest hotel, so they have the feel of how maybe the human resource manager does it, or if we can't take them there because it could be so ambitious, could be so expensive for many of our schools, videos, or inviting a person um, from there, for example, it's a, it could be the human resource manager or the, or the manager of this big hotel to come in and give, I would call it a live um, feeling of what the teacher would be talking about. Possibly the teacher has also never traveled to such a hotel at all. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to invite the panelists to just to, to sum up and to round up. Uh, I think it's important, but also a, a, a huge observation here in terms of the, the discussions. Um, this is my fourth time attending this conference, and I think uh, I get to see the same faces, the same people. Maybe we need to see more of those who actually call the shots, the ministers of finance, um, you know, some of these policy makers, uh, I've been in the education architecture for a long time, and I know um, the limited bargaining power sometimes the, the, the schools have, the ministers of education. I think, I think we should start bringing others who are able to call some of these shots, so have the decisions, maybe parents as well. Um, we are talking about 2030. Uh, I am a parent, and you know, I mean, some of, most of my kids have left the nest, but if 10 years ago my son said to me, I wanted to go fishing, I would have a cardiac arrest. So, and there are some parents who are still thinking that way. So maybe we need to start looking at how we bring those people who are able to make the decisions, because if we are still having this conversation 50 years after independence of Africa, uh, and we're still having the same problems, then uh, we're doing exactly what Einstein says we keep doing. So, so just to invite the panelists to round up, um, we'll, I'll start with Caitlin and then Vivian and, and Miriam. It's been a wonderfully rich discussion and I think the evidence of uh, all the bright ideas and uh, faces we have in the room and everyone staying power is reflective of just how important this shared mission is for all of us. And so um, I, you know, I think as we look ahead to 2030, obviously a child entering grade one today graduating from high school in 2030. What world will they be stepping into? And thank you so much to everyone who shared their thoughts today on that. Vivian? Um, just to reiterate uh, what Caitlin has said, uh, it's been such a, an enriching conversation and I hope that the discussions don't end here. Uh, we continue these conversations past the, the conference, 
forge partnerships um, with some of the best teachers that we have in the room today. But also, uh, when you get back home, uh, we continue making sure that when you're addressing the issue on the skills mis misgap and also um, inclusive education, that it's holistic. The community, as uh, Mariam said, has to be fully engaged. Um, has to be fully engaged. But the fight for quality education, the fight for skills, the fight for investment in education is our collective duty as we live here. Thanks. Okay, Maria. Um, somebody at some point, I think the, one of the first questions was asking what can we do who, and who can we learn from? And there are countries that have transformed themselves. We don't need to do everything, mm -hmm. um, but you know, Korea, South Korea, it's quite a, an extraordinary transformation that took place 30, 40 years, you know, from being right, right at the bottom of the Human Development Index to being in a position to, I think they're number seven or something now. Um, and while it's not all about economics, the HDI doesn't only measure that, but they absolutely prioritized education. And there, there are, you know, we... Somebody else said about the, the unions. The unions aren't fighting for teachers. They aren't fighting for teacher conditions. You can't live in Sierra Leone on a teacher's wage. In fact, you can't afford to join the union. And, you know, those things, you know, people need to be held to account. Presidents need to be held to account. Heads of state, heads of finance, heads of, of education. And we need to start actually getting some money into this sector. I mean, it's, it's controversial. There's lots of... Uh, big, big concern that I have about um, the way aid is done. Um, I work in that space to a certain extent, but we're trying to do it in a very different way. But I remember as I think a 14 year old going to a, a discussion on the Brandt report and came away going, oh my God, of course, trade, not aid, right? If we did fair trade and actually had the countries had a decent amount of money in their own control, then, you know, what we need is to level the playing field, make sure we have teachers earning enough, that teachers are a highly valued, prized group um, in society. In Sierra Leone, every office you go into is run by somebody who used to teach, but then they got a proper job. You know, that's got to stop. And, you know, we've, we've got to value our teachers, we've got to pay them enough to, to live on and require them to have high standards. Um, you know, 40% of our teachers are trained and qualified. And with no disrespect, not all of the training is worth having, um, and so on. So we, we, we need the world to actually wake up and you know, do aid in very, very different ways. And then we need our countries to be held to account and say, prioritize, where is the largest proportion of your population? Let's give them the level playing field that they need to actually be standing up and being part of the conversation about where the agendas go. Thank you very much. A round of applause to our esteemed panelists and thank you. A round of applause to yourselves. It was a very rich discussion and I, I hope we continue to have this discussion outside. Um, uh, I, I, can, I can feel the passion and so this is something that would keep going on. So let's keep talking. Let's keep on keeping on. Um, Aluta Continua. Thank you. Yeah.